call a court meeting to order at uh, 1.02. The machine is open. Let the minutes reflect we have eight council members present. I can't see who's absent. Mr. Konovich. Mr. Konovich, uh, Mr. Konovich is absent. At this time, we would like to sign for the pledge with, at the prayer with Mr. LaFrance. You lead us in the prayer, please, sir. And Dr. Gouy, lead us in the pledge. We take this moment to acknowledge Almighty God and thank him for our bountiful blessing, especially for the parish natural resources. We give thanks to God for our brave and courageous men and women in our military who daily risk their lives to protect our precious freedom. We pray that our world leaders to know how to obtain world peace. We pray that this government body, comprised of both council and administration, will always serve our parish with honesty, humility, and equal fall. And as this government body gathers today, we pray for wisdom to know right from wrong and the courage to do that which is right. This I pray in Jesus' mighty name and of all God's children say, Amen. 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 Good to allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Two, do we have, have any executive sessions? I have a graduation. Right. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Status Man. report by Man. executive port director. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Vice Chairman, members of the board. I am Sandy Sanders, executive director for Blackmans Port Harbor and Terminal District. Follows as my executive director's report for the reporting period of 10 through 23 May 2019. During this time frame, the Louisiana House of Representatives passed a supplemental pay bill for the port fire and rescue crews. It passed unanimously and in the Senate, it passed unanimously in the Senate Revenue and Finance Committees. The next step is to put it up for a full vote by the Senate and subsequently to the governor for his signature. Members of the staff and board attended the C. Alvin Bertel Award Luncheon honoring posthumously Jimmy Baldwin. I cannot think of anyone more deserving than Jimmy for this honor. Previous recipients include U.S. Senators, Congressmen, Mayors of New Orleans, and influential maritime leaders in the region. Jimmy certainly was an influential maritime leader. Lastly, this is Memorial Day weekend that began a few years after the Civil War, originally called Decoration Day, whereas family members decorated the grave sites for their fallen members. It became an official holiday in 1971, and the port would like to recognize the contribution made by fallen veterans who have given their lives in defense of our country. Mr. Chairman, subject to your questions or comments from you or the board, this concludes my report. Thank you. Any comments from the table? Mr. Roussel? Yes, uh, I thought that perhaps today we were going to address the, uh, the news articles that y'all had prepared the response to. Yes, sir. And are you going to address that today? I am prepared to do that. Okay. I didn't know you want me to do it my executive director comments? Yeah. It's not on the agenda, so I would think that would be an appropriate place. Okay. Yes, sir. I uh, went point for point uh, on the email that I received uh, regarding the questions from uh, the Mr. Dix article. Many of you have received this. So for the benefit of the, um, the uh, audience, uh, I, will, I can read my responses. <clears throat> the article appeared uh, probably about two, three weeks ago, and I was waiting to uh, confer with uh, the port assessor the attorneys of the uh, other uh, signatories to the MOU, which were CPRA and Tallgrass. To preface it, the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District 
<coughs> is the public entity involved in the Plaquemines Liquid Terminal Project. Plaquemines Port is a political subdivision of the state and public corporation of the state. State laws 34, 1351. The Plaquemines Parish Council is the sole governing authority of the Plaquemines Port and has the authority to approve the port's execution of the Plaquemines Liquid Project. In the port, Plaquemines Port Master Plan initiated on 9 June of 2011, one of the major tasks given to the port to fully realize its potential was the acquisition of land in order to become a landlord port. Upon my arrival to the port, another stated task of the master plan, I began to pursue the purchasing of properties, the first of which occurred on 6 December of 2013. The first question had uh, three sub, two sub-questions. Why didn't Plaquemines just have the PLT, Plaquemines Liquid Terminal, buy the land like in a normal industrial deal? 1A, what made Plaquemines want to get into the landlord business? Purchasing of the property for the Plaquemines Liquid Terminal Project is consistent with the master plan as noted above and in line with the objective of the port being a landlord port, a common business practice for maritime ports. The port, as a government agency, owns the land and then leases the land and or facilities to private tenants and customers. It is the same process used locally at the Port of New Orleans, Port of St. Bernard, the Port of South Louisiana, and the Port of Baton Rouge, which together with Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District makes up the largest port system in the world. Also on a national basis, the Port of New York, the Port of Los Angeles, yeah. Port of Houston, Port of Corpus Christi, Port of Miami, Port of Mobile, Port of Savannah, and many other similar examples also utilize this landlord business practice. Historically, large infrastructure projects have been funded by local, state, and federal dollars. But as these traditional funding sources have become more scarce, governments do not have the capital to invest. Alternative funding methods, financing methods, are now being used, such as what has now become known as public-private partnerships, or P3s. In short, a public entity receives private funding to support the project, whereas in the past, the public entity received that funding from another governmental source. The Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development is currently working on its first infrastructure, P3, to fund the replacing of the Bell Chase Bridge and Tunnel. The Plaquemines <coughs> Liquid Terminal Project is a true public-private partnership between Plaquemines Port, which is the public, and Tallgrass-Drexel-Hamilton, which is the private. The arrangement allows the private entity <clears throat> to develop a 20 million barrel storage and blending facility on the property while allowing the public entity to own the property and develop the remaining acreage, which is approximately 150 acres, and this is not inclusive of the mid barataria sediment diversion or of the 50 plus acres <coughs> set aside for the conservation easement buffeting the Ironton community. Question 1B. Did Plaquemines do any research into what's fair market value for rent on the 2.5 billion oil terminal? Answer. Rents are based on local real estate markets which exist at the time of the lease agreement. Fair market value for acquisition of the unimproved property was set by appraisal, appraisal of industry real estate experts in the lease terms negotiated by the Port Administration, reviewed by legal counsel, and approved by the Port Board. Question two, what makes this deal different from Cameron LNG Terminal that was declared unconstitutional in 2017? If this deal is legal, why is there a bill in the Louisiana House, House Bill number 76, right now to amend the Constitution to make this type of deal legal? The following answer was supplied by the Plaquemines assessor, Ms. Belinda Hazel. And I quote, my simplified understanding of the Cameron lawsuit follows. Governments are tax exempt. Private businesses are not. In the Cameron case, 
the parish government did not take title to the improvements, only to the land. Because the parish did not take title to the company's improvements, a requirement of making payments in lieu of taxes, i.e. a pilot, the company's improvements were taxable. The assessor in Cameron Parish filed the lawsuit. The court ruled in the assessor's favor, that is, that the improvements were not legally tax exempt. They were not eligible for payments in lieu of taxes and by law belonged on the tax roll. It is my understanding, again, Ms. Hazel, it is my understanding that our port will take title to the PLT project components owning both the land and improvements which meet the requirements of a pilot. Pilot payments are not illegal and the Cameron case does not hold that such payments are illegal. To the contrary, the Cameron case recognizes that pilot payments are legal if done properly as was done in the Plaquemines liquid terminal lease. Question 2A. If this deal is legal, why is there a bill in the Louisiana House right now to amend the Constitution to make this type of deal legal? House Bill 76 does not pertain to pilot programs such as this because House Bill 76 contemplates granting an exemption to private landowners. The PLT pilot program is designed to capture from the PLT, the leasee, equivalent amounts of money uh, equivalent to the ad valorem taxes, which as a public entity, the port as landowner is exempt from paying. Question 2B, will the parish be collecting property taxes on the property? Again, from Assessor Belinda Hazel. No, the port is the owner of record for the property. Government entities are tax exempt and do not owe property taxes on any property they own. As per my, and she puts in quotations, non-attorney understanding of lease agreements, the pilot program agreed upon by the port and PLT are to be equal to the amount of ad valorem taxes that would have been assessed if the project site and project components were owned by the leasee, but these payments are payments in lieu of taxes hence the pilot acronym. The, pilot, the PLT pilot program sets aside an amount equal to the full ad valorem tax from day one. This payment is based on the annual millage rates and includes both the assessed value of the land and once built will include the future improvements to the land, i.e. the terminal valuation. A traditional ICHEP program to attract development is not equal to a full ad valorem and is slowly escalated up from a reduced amount. The port understood from day one that when the property was purchased, it would be taken off the tax rolls as an exempt public entity owned property. To avoid any <coughs> reduction of revenues, the port insisted that the private partners enter into a payment in lieu of taxes, again, the pilot program that was equal to the full ad valorem. Prior to the property being acquired by the port, the ad valorem taxes received on this property were over $130,000. And upon the next reassessment cycle, this property will generate more than $200,000. However, for every 500 million in improvements on the property that will generate paid approximately 3.3 million annually in pilot. And it is estimated that the, uh, the, the land and the infrastructure will be close to huh? 2.2 billion. Right. Whole project will be 2 billion. So uh, when it's fully matured, this would be annually income to the parish or its taxing authorities in or around 12 million annually. <clears throat> Question three, why was the land assessed at 2 million in 2016 after the RAM had already paid 25 million for it? Is it because the land is only worth 2 million? If so, 
then the parish should not have accepted a 30.5 million gift with repayment provisions for it. Or was it assessed at 2 million so RAM could avoid paying property taxes at the 25 million level? Once again, according to Plaquemines assessor Belinda Hazel. Oops, on behalf of the researcher and or author of the article. Yes, the land is assessed for 2.1 million and that assessed value of 2.1 million is based on a market value of 21 million. The 21 million figure is the value estimate that would be bounced around for com comparison sales, not the assessed value of 2.1, which by law is 10% of the market value. In addition to the property, additional value included items previously paid for by the seller, including engineering and design, geotech investigations approved for wetland delineation, mitigation credits for eight acres, feasibility, and pre-permitting studies. There's also been a reduction of inventory of large tracts upriver, such as the Formosa petrochemical recently consumed 2,100 acres in the St. James Parish, and the reduction in these large inventory tracts on the river has resulted in the prices of these large tracts escalating. Question four. Is there a document that shows how the payments in lieu of taxes will be distributed by the port to the three taxing bodies, i.e., the parish council, the school board, and the sheriff? And where is this document? To date, the formal document outlining the funding distribution to the taxing bodies has not been finalized. The council, as the sole governing authority of the port, will decide during a public port meeting, port board meeting, how and when the money will be distributed. All pilot payments are deposited into and held in a separate port account for the purpose of distribution as approved by the council. How many permanent jobs will this project create? 25? Considering this is an out-of-state company moving out-of-state oil for sale outside of the state, what is Plaquemines getting out of further industrializing the parish and jeopardizing the property values of residences and small businesses? Industrialization has been terrible for small businesses and residential property values in places like Cameron and St. Parish in St. James Parishes. Answer. For the past 14 years, Plaquemines Parish has worked to rebuild areas of the parish <clears throat> that were destroyed by Hurricane Katrina with the goals to provide jobs, tax revenue, and repopulate communities such as Port Sulphur. We believe that projects such as Plaquemines Liquid Terminal fits in line with this objective with an anticipated 1,200 construct construction jobs and 34 permanent jobs with an average salary ranging from seventy-five dollars to $90,000. Our intent is to rebuild communities. What happens if, question six, what happens if in accordance with section 4.1D of the lease agreement, the state takes hyphen buys the land it wants for the diversion but it doesn't pay what the port paid for the land. Who makes up the difference? What happens if the state takes the land through eminent domain? The state, through the MOU signed by the port, the Tallgrass Energy, and CPRA, states that CPRA may request to buy the land from the port and the council, as the and the council, as the governing authority of the port, will have to vote to sell the specific land. There is no specific timetable regarding when CPRA will ask to purchase the land. CPRA, as a public entity, is obligated to purchase the land at fair market value. The property has already valued in excess of what the port paid for it, and this expectation based, based on planned development usually causes the property values to rise. It is highly unlikely in the event that the fair market value of the property in the future is less than what the port paid. The council does not have to agree to sell the property. The state's right to expropriate property through the doctrine of eminent domain applies to private property. 
What happens to the land if POT abandons the project? The parish can't sell the land without POT's approval under section 4.1c of the lease agreement. Does the land just sit there with nobody paying property taxes? If POT abandons the project prior to December of 2022, the lease provides that the Plaquemines Liquid Terminal may attempt to market the property in order to get its initial monies used to purchase the property back plus 12%. The port also has first right of refusal. If the port cannot be sold for a fair market price, the port and PLT will work together to attempt to lease the property with the lease payments used first to pay the PLT its in initial expense and plus the 12%. In no event is the port required to pay POT any monies from port funds. So these are the responses to the questions that were asked on that article. Uh, thank you for all of those responses. And I've been asked uh, specifically on question six. If the parish decides not to sell the property to CPRA for the diversion, then the parish actually has a veto to kill the diversion project? Whenever they decide to uh, purchase the property, they will come to the council and request the, uh, the sale of the property. If for some reason this board, serving as the governing authority of the port, decides not to do so, um, the words, the statements that you made, that it's not the statement of the port itself. So I, we cannot make that statement. It's not a statement, it's a question that I'm asking. Well, it's not a question we can answer because you're making a statement, making an assumption, a assumptive question that we cannot answer, so. Thank you for your non-answer. You know, I try to work with you guys and I try to ask a legitimate question of questions that have been asked of me. And then when I ask a legitimate question, I get a dodge. And that's not uncommon for this discussion, but I understand you're saying that we don't know what's gonna happen, but when you put this document together and we all approved it, there's a lot of unknowns in here. And this is just a hypothetical situation that I've been asked. Does the parish council, by refusing to sell the property, have the veto on a diversion and can kill the project? Now, that's an answer, that's a question that you should ask CPRA, not the port staff. Because we don't have that answer because they make the decision where the diversion goes, not the port staff. Thank you for your So knowledge. if you guys, if, if, if the council serving as the governing authority of the port, when CPRA comes to ask for this particular land that they believe is best for the diversion, and the, the council serving as the governing authority agrees not to sell the land to them, then what happens next is a, is a, answer, a, a question to be answered by CPRA and not the port staff. Because we do not take a position one way or the other on what happens to the diversion. And that's my understanding of your question. So I would ask you to direct that question to Chip Klein and the staff of CPRA. Any other comments from the table? Audience? Next item, please. Sure. I All right, come up here, state your name, sir. Any address? Uh, my name is uh, Kendall. Wait till you get to the mic, if you don't mind. Uh, Thank my, you very much. My name is uh, Kendall Dix. I uh, wrote the uh, op-ed in question. I also wrote some of the, uh, the questions that, uh, that Mr. Sanders uh, read about there. So one of the first things that I would like to comment on is that the port stated that its authority uh, to buy the land was derived from the uh, uh, Louisiana Statute 34 uh, 1351. Um, that's a series of statutes that lay out the, uh, uh, the state granted authority of the port <coughs> to do certain activities. And I would point you all to uh, 341353. Um, I'll read it. The district acting by and through its governing authority is authorized to acquire by purchase, donation, expropriation, appropriation, or otherwise any lands in the district needed for railways, war wharves, sheds, buildings, canals channels and other facilities required for the operation of the district and to be owned and operated 
by the district, except, this is, this is the key part, except those lands or parcels of lands upon which structures, buildings, pipelines, or improvements are constructed and actually used for industrial purposes. So when this statute was created, it seemed to envision a scenario like this and explicitly said this is not part of the authority granted by the state. So I question whether or not um, the port had the authority to buy land in the first place if it was going to be used for pipelines and industrial purposes. Um, another thing that I would point to is the, uh, the job numbers and the capital expenditures. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Sanders, but I believe a lot of that is going to be uh, connected to the pipeline uh, that is to be built. Is that right? It's the whole total project. The whole total the project. In, in, in result is correct, 30, 35. Okay, 30, 35 jobs, a lot of the construction jobs are going to be out of it. They're saying $2 billion in capital expenditures, but I question whether or not a lot of that is going to go towards the pipeline and will actually be under the uh, taxing authority slash rent, whatever you want to call it. Um, if it's the, so the other question is, where is the money going to come from for the port to buy this? If the deal is only constitutional, if they buy all of the fixtures and machinery that go into the liquids terminal, where is that money going to come from? The other thing that I would uh, say is to answer that question about uh, whether or not uh, the port or CPRA should be answering the question about whether or not that land is going to be sold for the diversion, I would point to the MOU that the port signed with PLT stating that they would sell it. Let me, I will read from the MOU, acquisition of the CPRA tract. CPRA has been granted the authority to acquire property for certain projects authorized pursuant to the master plan and enabling litigation. CPRA desires to purchase the CPRA tract and subject to the following sentence, PLT agrees to release the PPHTD and CPRA tract and PPHTD agrees subject to the approval of the council acting as the sole governing authority to convey the CPR tra CPRA tract by amicable, amicable sale or other form of transfer. It, uh, it goes on from there, but more or less I would say that you've already agreed to the sale. Um, then you have the only thing that's left really is a, a question again of how much it's going to be worth. Uh, the port is saying that if it's not the value that you guys want, that you don't have to sell it. But I would point to this memo saying that that's not factually accurate. Um, again, going back to the, uh, the difference in assessed value versus, uh, versus market value, $21 million uh, it was the assessed value for the land. It was still less than what uh, RAM paid for it. Again, in less than three years, um, that property value went up by uh, 50%. That's, uh, that is a rate of growth that I'm not really uh, too familiar with. I don't know what happened in those three years to make the price go up by $10 million. Um, but as far as I know, it's not listed in any of those uh, reasons in the port statement when it comes to engineering and all that, because at that point, the RAM project had more or less been abandoned. Um, another <coughs> point that I would uh, point to is that we've heard of several times that the council is the sole governing authority of the port. But it seems that there's some dispute there, seeing as that the parish and the port have agreed to go forward with some sort of lawsuit to determine who's actually in charge of the port. Um, I don't know if you all feel comfortable uh, with that or not. Um, one other thing that I wanted to point out with the job numbers is that we uh, see average salaries. And I feel like that number is often quite distorted. A lot of times you'll see uh, entry-level salaries, which are the bulk of um, the jobs that go out, being much lower, sometimes barely higher than minimum or living wage, with really top-heavy management salaries going to people that are outside the parish, something else to look at. Um, I think that's uh, about it. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, I'm here. I'm a real person. Um, I just, you know, I'm, go ahead. Mr. Matthews, you have some questions for you. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the comments by Mr. Dix. Uh, please excuse my voice. I'm, I'm just not feeling well. I apologize. But in reference to Title 34, Section 1353, um, regarding the exception issue, the exception is that the port cannot expropriate property that's already being used for an industrial purpose uh, or take property away that's already being used. So if there was an operation already going on on a particular property, and the port wanted to take it away to operate it for something else, the port legally, according to state law, cannot do that. And that is the exception that Mr. Dix is talking about as it reads, except those lands or parcels and lands upon which structures, buildings, pipelines, or improvements are constructed, 
and actually used for industrial purposes. So if something was actually being used for that purpose, we could not expropriate. And I would uh, cite a case uh, with St. Bernard, and I think it was the Violet Dock, um, in which St. Bernard expropriated property that was already being used for an industrial purpose, and they sought to lease it to um, a tenant. And so the court has stated that that should not have been done. And if it was going to be expropriated, it should have been expropriated for a whole lot more money. And so that is already precedent on the books, on the laws, uh, oh, through court cases, excuse me, precedent through court cases, um, which show that you cannot do that. So um, with the, the issue of um, average salaries, um, I, believe that, I believe that we've looked at the salaries could range and, uh, uh, between 80 to 100,000 in some ranges. Now, those are based on uh, standard numbers in the maritime industry. Um, as you may or may not know, in the New Orleans region, uh, the number two largest employer uh, is the maritime industry because we have five ports on the lower Mississippi River. Um, the, the largest employer are restaurants and tourism, um, obviously, but the ranges are between um, 80 to 100,000 for those standard jobs. Now, what is the high and what is the low? Um, which one is more likely? Um, I, I do not have that answer. I can also put forth to you, for every one direct job that's in a port, four jobs are created indirectly. And we won't have that number until it's developed. I can also say that one out of every five jobs in the state of Louisiana are directly linked back to the maritime industry. So this will be a great project for our region. And I want to give credit to the board, and specifically uh, Chairman Bartholomew, who has pushed constantly to us to lead in the effort of hiring locally. And we have pushed that with PLT consistently, and we believe that we have the right people in this parish that will be hired, have the experience, have the skills for these jobs. And we will come back to this board, and I think our feet will be put to the fire by our chairman and the rest of the board to say how many of those jobs are locally meeting in the parish and also regionally. And so, and we believe in that wholeheartedly. So I really appreciate your statement and your questions. Thank you. My pleasure. Any other comments? Table? Audience? Next, please. I got some more down. I'm sorry. Yeah, she next. Come on up. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Grace Morris. I'm an organizer with the Sierra Club. Um, one question I have is uh, for Director Sanders is what happens when Tallgrass Energy does not get its permits for its proposed oil export terminal? I will go back and I have you check the lease. Um, in the lease, it shows what the process is if PLT does not move forward with this project. And it's been stated by Mr. Sanders, and it's very clear in the lease what will happen if, PL, if PLT does not move forward with this project. It's pretty clear in the lease. Thank you. Can you read that information for us? Do we have the, the, uh, the, the divorce clause? It's, it's, uh, I don't have it with me here, but the, the, you're asking specifically about the permit. I can say specifically about the project itself, as Mr. Sanders has said, if they decide to not go through with the project, Mr. Sanders has clearly stated what happens. Now, I can provide you the, the lease agreement. We can provide a copy of it. And if you would like to come to our office, I can show you clearly and highlight for you, absolutely. I do not have it uh, in my hand, though. Um. Well, I think, I mean, we could read it here. Uh, th there still is some confusion, even with the lease agreement as written. Who ultimately holds the risk and the liability for this project? So if Tallgrass Energy does not get its permits and this oil export terminal does not get built, who has to pay at the end of the day? Is it the Plaquemines Parish taxpayer? Who's holding the bag? No. Let me, or is it let me be clear. No, no, let me be clear about something. I'm sorry. Okay. So is it the Plaquemines Parish taxpayer who's left holding the bag for this very risky, uneconomic project, or is it Tallgrass Energy who is is holding the risk and its shareholders? Well, let, let's be clear on something. The um, I don't accept the, the the question in that. It's, it's, there's no risk to the taxpayer because the taxpayer is not involved in this, this process, okay? So the port, which is a state entity who operates, 
by tariff revenues, not from tax dollars, is in agreement with uh, Plaquemines Liquid Terminals, which is a joint venture between Tallgrass and Drexel Hamilton. If, the, uh, if Tallgrass deems that this is not viable, and they have till 2022 to deem that, then the port, which is a state en entity, and Tallgrass will work together to commercialize the property with other leases, period. If past that time, they walk away from it, then hey, the port has no risk whatsoever. The parish taxpayer has no risk whatsoever. As a matter of fact, if this operation gets developed, the permits happen and all the good things about the lease happen, then we'll be seeing millions and millions of dollars coming to the, to the, um, in a pilot payment to parish government as the council sees fit to dole it out. There is a divorce clause that we have in there, once again, that says in 2022, if they have not deemed this uh, viable, that they will move forward in working with us to get the property commercialized by other endeavors. But if they just walk away after that point, then the property goes the divorce clause. The divorce clause. Yeah. If, in fact, they decide that there's going to be a termination because they can't, for whatever reason, it's not feasible then they, the property can be sold and they will get their investment back, but none of it will ever come, no amount of money will ever come from the port for any shortfall that the uh, PLT would, might suffer if in fact the property doesn't sell for what they put into it. I thank you. Well, so that investment, um, we've been it understood as 30.5 million. How will Tallgrass get its investment back? Where will that $30.5 million come from? I think we, okay, to repeat, it will either, there will either be leasing of the property to, to commercial owners, and they'll get the proceeds from the lease until they're made whole again, or alternatively, the property will be sold. So the property will be sold, and the proceeds from that sale of the property would go back to uh, PLT to the extent they paid the $30.5 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no, mo no money will come from out of the pocket of the port towards PLT or anyone else if the, either one of those happens. I wonder if Tallgrass would see it that way. I mean, it really does sound like Plaquemines is being held hostage for $30.5 million and, until and it's and paid back to Tallgrass. Well, I, I don't know how to answer that in, except that that's wrong. Is Tallgrass here? I'm sorry? Okay. All right, no further questions. Thank you. I have a point if I can make real quick about that. Well, I don't think you can, the rules are once you have, you can't come back up. Sorry. Unless the board want to object to that ruling. In the spirit of transparency, can we allow that? Well, we have to take a vote, yes or no. <coughs> Move okay. to what, waive a rule? We have Rick waived the rule of giving him another chance to come All right. Up. So uh, open the machine, please. And yes or no? Yes is to extend him and the courtesy of coming back. And no, it follow the rules that has been established by this government, this council. <coughs> 6-2, so you are in favor of repeating. Okay. So um, there's a question there about whether or not the taxpayers uh, would be harmed there by um, the lack of sale. And I would argue that since uh, the port has now taken ownership of the land, um, if so, again, this provision in 4.1c uh, survives the termination of the agreement. So this property is encumbered forever. Um, and uh, Tallgrass, or I mean PLT, has the final say over whether or not it's going to be sold or not. So in theory, if, it can't se if you can't sell or lease it, it just sits there not collecting taxes until you find someone that does. And seeing as how you were collecting taxes before it, again, and that I think it was 130000 a year or something like that, that is $130,000 a year harm to the taxpayers. Again, I would point to 4.1D that if CPRA doesn't give you the money for the investment minus 12%, it is absolutely written in there 
that the that uh, tall grass or PLT is going to ma be made whole. That's going to come from the taxpayers. But you guys are just insistent that you're going to get your money, but there's no guarantee. All right, which, which can we talk about which part? Continue on your uh, statement. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just re should I read the provision? Okay, in the event that lessee determines it is required to use less than all of the project site for the project as of the FID date or a release of the portion of the project site is necessary with respect to Louisiana CPRA and its comprehensive master plan. This is the exact scenario that we're talking about here. The lessee shall promptly release such a portion of the site from, from this agreement. That's uh, PLT. In such event, lessor, and that's the port, and lessee, PLT, shall execute a written agreement, written amendment to this agreement providing therefore. The lessor, the port, shall not permit any activities or any portion of the property not included in the project site or released from the project site that materially interferes with the construction, operation, or maintenance of the project or create completion with the project. That's uh, the uh, liquids terminal. In the event the lessor, the port, sells or leases any of the portion of the property not included in the project site or released from the project site, the lessor, the port, agrees to repay or cause the developer of such site to repay, that could be CPRA, the lessee, PLT, a proportional amount of the lessee investment plus or minus 12% mm -hmm. from the proceeds of the sale or lease, mm -hmm. provided that if the proceeds from a sale are insufficient mm -hmm. to repay the lessee investment minus 12%, the lessor, that's the port, shall be required to pay any shortfall. Mm -hmm. Again, this survives the expiration or termination of this agreement. Right. So when it says that the port shall be required to pay any shortfall, how is that wrong? Okay. So you... So we have an agreement in place, as you have seen consistently, and as Mr. Um, Sanders has stated, that uh, has shown that the property has increased over time, the value of the property. The port paid for the property for less than what it was deemed worth. Now, the anticipation is that the port is going to develop this property along with PLT, and the value will rise based on the improvements that are on the property. And then, P and then CPRA at some point will come in and seek to uh, buy the land. Now, just the thought that when people improve property, the value goes up. That is the anticipation. And the, the value will go up. And so let's say if the, the property that was purchased, just for safe numbers, was, um, was uh, $5. And so now you add the 12% value in there, the port or the developer, right, will then um, pay the 12%. Well, we anticipate that the price would be able to handle that 12% mark. The idea is that if something drastically happens to where the value of the property significantly goes down, which is not going to happen, we do not ant anticipate, nor does PLT anticipate, that happening. Furthermore, the question regarding just letting the property sit there, no one who's going to spend $30 million and not going to do anything with it wants the property to sit there and not make any money. So it will look to lease the property out or sell it so they can get their money back. That's simple business practices. And your position about the taxpayers paying it back, the port does not receive funds from the taxpayers to operate. So that is just exactly just not true. So I, so I disagree with the basis of your argument, sir. Does property value ever go down? Excuse, excuse me. We, we're not going to continue to have a, a dialogue back and forth. You stated your objective. You stated your concern. And he answered it. So unless you have something else, we're going to just move to the next person that may have a question. Now, what I suggest is a strong evidence. If you want to have a dialogue, we can set up a meeting with the port. Or you to put it on the agenda for a discussion. Till it's then, till will, it's that, will that be a discussion be made available to the public? You can have it at the next meeting, request to be placed on the agenda for discussion, if you so desire. If, if I'm the one that has to ask the questions, then yeah, I'll do that. All right. So just send a, a letter of request in to do that, to make sure we have it from your request and we can put it on the agenda. I will do that. All right. Thank you, sir. Anyone else in the audience? I, I just have one follow-up. How do you rectify what he say he read concerning the purchase of the property, the statements that are made in there for the diversion and CPR's age? How do you uh, what, what particular part, sir? The part that he stated that uh, the port agreed to sell that they would uh, make the sale available for 
the diversion. It's subject to council approval. But you, a minute ago, never mind, I'm wasting my time with you. Any other questions from the table? Audience, next, next item, please. 3A, financial report. Financial report. Um, budget to actual report was sent to the board on May 17, 2019. Um, to date, I have not received any questions, and if you have any to date, please let me know. Any comments from the table? Audience? Next item, please. Bids and advertisements. Have any? None. Next Number five, introduction of ordinances and resolutions. I have one. A resolution authorizing the full executive director. Mr. Bernard J. Sanders for and on behalf of Plaquemine Parish Port Harbor and Terminal District to name and accept a proposal of Plaquemine Gazette as the official journal for Plaquemine Parish. Uh, Council and as the sole governing authority of Plaquemine Parish Port Harbor and Terminal District and otherwise to provide respect there too. That's all I have. Any, uh, anybody else? I have one. Mr. Roussel? Yes, a resolution rescinding a resolution adopted June 28, 2018 in connection with a preliminary agreement between the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District and Plaquemines Liquid Terminals LLC to finance acquiring land and constructing dock, wharf, and all rail improvements pipeline and pumping infrastructure, blending storage facility improvements, and any additional improvements related thereto, but retaining the right to reimburse Plaquemines Liquid Terminal LLC with proceeds of limited obligation revenue bonds in the future and providing for other matters in connection with the foregoing. Mr. Black? No. Mr. Newberry? No. Frost? None. none. Six A, there are none. Six B, a resolution to amend Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District's Accounting and Procedures Manual to require execution of a written cooperative, cooperative endeavor agreement with regards to any task, work, or service provided by any public entity for Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District, and to require the same regarding any task, work, or service provided by Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District for any public entity. Uh, I'll I'll go ahead. Discussion. A second for discussion. Mr. Goy. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Earlier this week, uh, I sent some documents to the council members, uh, specifically um, enabling documents from the uh, state constitution, uh, an opinion, attorney general opinion, uh, both regarding the use of cooperative endeavor agreements, and then several uh, existing CEAs that the port has with uh, Plaquemines Parish government, with the sheriff, with the regional planning. And I ask you to take a look at that um, and then look at the language in the resolution. And next week, I'll, 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 I will call each and speak with each of the council members to see what your opinion is going to be and whether or not uh, this should be taken up as, a, uh, as an item now or is it something that we should take up in the future. Uh, my personal feeling is that this board is required to direct the port staff and administration in their duties and responsibilities that are not already covered by um, uh, through legal avenues. And uh, even though the port has been very diligent in their uh, execution of CEAs in the past, uh, I could find nothing in the procedure man, procedures uh, manual that was a directive from the board to engage in CEAs. And so the language here is a very simple um, uh, statement that the port staff shall do so. And of course, any CEA that is proposed would have to be approved by this board. Um, I'll leave with that, um, and I will be 
discussing it with you, see what your, what your thoughts are, uh, and uh, make a decision whether to uh, vote on it, um, if I feel we should vote on it next time or withdraw it. So I'll leave with that, but uh, the floor is open, yeah. Mr. Chair. Mr. Rousseau. Oh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Goy, for providing the documents that you uh, sent to us during the week, and I did have a chance to review them. And, uh, you know, I've come to pretty much a, a conclusion from the documents. For instance, the opinion 080285 is uh, an opinion that deals with private entities. And if you look at what you yeah, highlighted, I read the documents that Dr. Gooey sent to us in justification of uh, this resolution. I, first of all, I believe the resolution should wait until after the court case is completed so we can have an understanding of what cooperative endeavor agreements that we need to enter into. We do need to enter into cooperative endeavor agreements at the right time. This resolution is all encompassing and covers the waterfront and I don't believe that that's the position that we should be taking at this time prior to the lawsuit. But the supporting documents, for instance, uh, the opinion 08-2085 uh, is an opinion from the Attorney General that really applies to private entities when government gives private entities funding and they recommend that you do the cooperative, endeavor, the cooperative endeavor agreement with that private entity as it states right here. Uh, thus we believe that in order to establish that a public purpose exists and to show the expenditure of public funds was non-gratuitous and constitutionally authorized, there must be some documentation of the agreement between the political subdivision expending the public funds and the private entity receiving them, which at the heart of my problem is the port and the council, which we are litigating. And this resolution covers the waterfront, which mandates that we have to have that. Even if you look at the syllabus on the top of the Attorney General's opinion, it says, public funds may be spent even if the expenditure does not fall within the exception in 14B or is not in a cooperative endeavor agreement pursuant to 14C, so long as the public entity is able to establish that the expenditure meets all three prongs of the Cabela case. So we're in the courts litigating this now, and that's why I think that this is right to wait. Now, for instance, the Sheriff Cooperative Endeavor Agreement. I believe that since we are not the sole governing authority of the Sheriff's Office, we should enter into a Cooperative Endeavor Agreement if we're going to share our resources and so forth. Uh, however, on the other hand, we have entered into a Cooperative Endeavor Agreement with ourselves to provide drainage on the VG property, which in my opinion was not necessarily needed because if the statutes allowed a port to do its own drainage work, it could have easily done that without having an engagement with the council and what we went through with the Cormier administration about who pays for the pipe and the parish workforce and all. Since they have the authority, if you want to say they, as the port through the governing authority to do these type of things, I say that's an instance that Dr. Gooey sent out that was not needed as a cooperative endeavor agreement. So the bottom line in the same time, I think that it needs some work and I think it undermines uh, the position of the litigation that we're in until we get clarification. So having said that, uh, I would hope that you all would read the documents that you were forwarded and get a thorough understanding of them to be able to understand what the argument really is. And I'm not opposed to cooperative endeavor agreements. When they're needed, they're needed. But the resolution is, again, closing. Um, it covers the waterfront. Thank you, Congressman. Any other comments from the table? Audience? Yeah. My question was State, uh, Give us your address and your name. Right? Huh? State your address and your and your. Uh, your Reverend Tyrone Everett, downtown Phoenix, 112 Thomas Lane. Thank uh, you. Uh, the, the legal case that you're talking about, is this, this legal case going to talk about the, the role and authority between the parish council and the port authority? Is, would that be addressed in that? Well, uh, the heart of the case is the fact that the audit committee audited the port. And the results of that audit exposed a violation of the Constitution. However, the port has taken a position now that we have violated the Constitution by auditing them and not having an agreement and them paying us. And when I try to explain that to people in the public, they scratch their head and kind of wonder how silly that really is. 
but it is an issue. And now that we have the votes that have passed this and put it in the court, that's the issue that we're going to be litigating. Okay. The reason why I brought it up because uh, as the public, the public is really very confused about the relationship between the poet and the parish authority because most people in the parish believe, think that it should be, but a poet is the arm of the parish government and the parish government is over the poet. But there's some people feel there's a different opinion on people in terms of who really control the poet. Uh, because one of the things that made when the young man was talking and, and my friend next to me said that you don't get any taxpayer dollars, but if the Pope is under the parish government, then that is the taxpayer dollars, the mere fact that it's under the parish government. So I, I just think that, Mr. Bartholomew, that when he had this hearing that the young man was talking about, maybe something need to be, a hearing need to be in place so that the public because really, the relationship between his parish, government, and the Pope been confusing for a long time because I remember when some years ago when the council, when Judge Connor was here, the parish attorney, council attorney, they created this committee, and this committee ended up becoming a commission. And from that point on, it's been uh, some contentions about this Pope authority ever since then, really before uh, Mr. Sanders got here, that's been a real issue. And so I'm still confused, like a lot of other public people, you know, is the Pope a part of the Paris government or its own private entity? That's the question that people in the community well, still don't understand. Uh, let me just say this, that uh, there's a lot of issues that are laying there underneath the surface. For instance, the pilot program that they just referred to does not go to the government. It goes to the port. And the port has to decide what to do with that. It just so happens that the nine members up here are the governing authority of the port. And in their argument about meeting the test of non-donation of public funds, the port will have to make an agreement with those taxing bodies to show that it meets the Cabela test, that they are going to be able to provide a service up and above what they are providing now to be able to get paid for that. So, you know, they are arguing, but they also are taking the position that uh, we can't distribute that fund unless it meets those tests. So it is confusing. However, as you had stated, in the past, the government subsidized this port to the tune of millions and millions of dollars out of its general fund. So that's taxpayer dollars. That's, what's in, that's the history of it. Now, they wouldn't be sitting where they are today had it not been for this government propping up this port and nurturing it along to grow into an entity that has revenues now that can support itself. And so, you know, people forget the history of it, but that's what really happened and how this port got to be grown. And not to mention the fact that all of the security fees that have been coming along since the 911 situation has really filled the coffers. And now with the land purchase and the rents, it fills the coffers even more. But it shouldn't be able to walk away from the rest of the government and the citizens of this parish and not return a return to the constituents. And, and, I, and I think, Mr. Tolman, I think that's the concern of most public people in the public is that enormous amount of money that's going into the port and looking at the parish employees, how many people have been laid off and the amount of pay and other service that people don't receive, we haven't seen no return on this. So I hope that Mr. Bartholomew in this hearing take place, that there be some kind of information to show how much revenue have come, have came into the poll from where and how much of it is going back into the Paris Fund to help deal with some of the needed service, not um, some of the needed things that Paris employees need, but also needed service that the general community need. Any other comments from the audience? On Bashel, 8603, Highway 39, Braithwaite. One correction, the people of Plaquemines Parish do get taxed one time by the port. There was a millage passed at one time, and we did pay into the port. And it could happen again. So, thank you. Thank you for that comment, because I forgot about that, but I shouldn't have. Any other comments? Hearing, next item, please. Number 7A, there are none. Uh, we said it was just for discussion, so it was 
There are none for 7A, 7B, discussion of railroad system. Council Member, Commissioner Bartholomew. Yes, uh, Sant, someone want to deal with that? Discuss that, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, Mr. Mainly, it's mainly the, uh, from the Gretna standpoint, the uh, issues that's confronted, talking about the changes in the uh, yes, sir. system. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, there's been uh, a lot of recent consternation uh, with the city of Gretna and a proposed change <coughs> to the, the rail alignment. Um, so Mr. Bartholomew asked me if I would address that as the executive director of the port and how that affects us. Um, First of all, the rail and Gretna is really between the rail and Gretna. However, it truly does affect the port, so we just cannot sit there and, and be an innocent bystander and watch this go by. Uh, Bob Bach in the New Orleans Gulf Coast, uh, in a manner to ease the movement of rail through Gretna, uh, put in there a curve that would allow the rail to take a smoother transition instead of going up to the Goolsbury Yard and stopping traffic for long periods of time to negotiate a curve uh, and bring it along the route that it would take after it does negotiate the Goolsbury Yard. Uh, as it happens, this, this curve is going through uh, some, a, a, piece, so a couple of pieces of property, some of which are vacant, Others, the city of Gretna had their eyes on a, a business was going to form, uh, I believe, uh, for a, uh, an elderly center and community center. <clears throat> so that, uh, that is what triggered it. And I think one of the unintended consequences of that were that folks in Gretna felt that the New Orleans Gulf Coast was going to be complacent with the rail by just easing the transition through Gretna and leaving it there. Well, that is not the intent of the port. The intent of the port has always been to utilize the existing rail, but ultimately the rail will come, uh, uh, come from Avondale and then do a 90 degree turn and come down the Harvey Canal and it will parallel the New Peters Road. It will come across the Intercoastal Canal, wrap around the south side of the Naval Air Station, and then tie into the existing rail that uh, follows the signature of the river. That has always been our intent. Um, even though the curve in Gretna would smooth uh, the negotiated rail through Gretna, that is not uh, a do or die for the Port of Plaquemines. So I have uh, uh, contacted Bob Bach, and I told him that that's, that's not necessary for us. It might help y'all out, but to uh, ensure that he is not saying that the port needs this. I've also written a letter, I've written a letter to um, Belinda Constant, the mayor of Gretna, expressing the same thing to her. Uh, as far as commercializing the port, yes, we are going to need rail, and that's why we have looked at the rail that goes through Gretna, and the existing rail is not going to be able to put the port to where it needs to be. So uh, uh, the project of going around the Naval Air Station was one that they already had on the drawing board, uh, and it's one that I fully uh, embrace. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Mm -hmm. General. Uh, any comments from the table? Mr. Russell? Uh, do, do you know what the schedule is on the environmental uh, clearance for the relocation of the rail and the status of that project? The, the EIS is completed. Now they're looking at the rights of ways. And then uh, the new legislation that was popped up in Baton Rouge for the environmental impacts that this yeah. curve puts in. Do you know what uh, the status of that you. is? Thank I, you. I was going to mention that. Uh, yes, uh, Gretna uh, also stated, and they got um, a bill or uh, a, a resolution, yeah, 
in the, in the state legislature that if they were going to make changes, i.e. this curve, then they wanted to have public hearings. Uh, I told Bob Bach, this is not the hill to die on, you know, it's, and it's not. And uh, we need to uh, continue to work with Gretna and Jefferson Parish to reassure them that our original wish list requirement was to stick with the original plan, come down Harvey, and, um, and go across the, uh, the intercoastal canal. The curve would, would accommodate a, a cleaner, quicker rail. It, it would close 22 crossings, but in light of the fact that where they were going to put that rail, it, does, it goes against some um, uh, economic development plans that Gretna has. So again, that's, that's not the hill to die on. You look like you have a question, Mr. LaFrance. Yeah. No, oh, sir. I'm sorry. Okay. <clears throat> and any comments from table? Audience? I do, Mr. Bartholomew. Um, uh, Councilman Black? When you say, Mr. Sanders, that's not the hill to die on, um, is, is, is the rail, is the PLT project? Uh, dependent on that? Dependent on, on the rail through Gretna. Right. Um, the PLT project uh, will be receiving most of their, their feedstock via pipeline. Let me ask you this, at another term, I guess. Is the opposition to PLT from uh, the elected officials in Gretna and Jefferson Parish, is it because of the increase of rail traffic or potential thereof? Uh, the curve really would um, just eliminate the stalling of the train while it goes into the Goosebury Yard and then has to come out the same rail. Right, that but they're it against out. the curve. Uh, no, sir. They're That's not? Right. No. And, and I've made it very clear I thought you right just now said that, that they, they, were, they have three. They had issues with the curve because of some economic development in that area. That, that was their main, the, the folks in Gretna, their main thing is that the curve uh, where, it, where they're going to place it uh, is against, uh, uh, they already had that site for another economic development project. All right, so what I'm saying then, are they against the curve? Yes, right. they, they are that's against the curve. That's what I asked a couple times before. That is correct. So back to the original question, is the PLT project, is the rail system through Gretna, uh, is, is the PLT project dependent on that? No, sir. We can live with what the present thing is right now. They can, they've told us it can accommodate three unit trains a week, and we can live with that. Uh, uh, we, uh, the predominance of the fee stock is going to be coming by, via pipeline. Now, that would assist in uh, hurrying up the, uh, the, the bypass, but we can certainly live with not putting in the curve and keeping the present rail configuration to support the Plaquemines port. So just to be clear, in your conversations with the city of Gretna, whether it be the council, the mayor, Jefferson Parish, whether it be the council, the president, uh, as well as the state rep in Jefferson Parish in that area, you're comfortable to say that they're in support of PLT? Yes, I, yeah, we've talked about the PLT with them many, many, many times. They support the PLT. They support the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District. But the, the curve certainly threw a, a, a curve ball, so to speak. So uh, again, I, I wrote the letter. And my intent is to go uh, do face-to-face -face meetings just to reassure them that as far as the port is concerned, we are satisfied and wholly put our arms wrap around the, uh, the bypass going around the Naval Air Station. All right, thanks. Councilman Gray. Uh, General, the, um, our primary focus has always been the bypass. It's always been to bypass that rail, get it out of Bell Chase, Gretna, move it through the corridor. Is there a concern from the Gretna folks that this curve 
will satisfy the needs of the rail so that the bypass would be put way on the back burner. I, th I think that was an unintended consequence. They thought that they were going to get comfortable with the curve. Uh, it would increase the, the velocity through Gretna. And, um, and, and that's, that's probably a normal thing for them to think. They've been wanting that rail out of Gretna. We've been wanting it out of, out of Bell Chase. And so I don't want it to folks to think we're, we're going to get comfortable with that. We need the rail to come down Harvey Canal and around the Naval Air Station. And, and I think that's the point, that um, that's our future. Yes, sir. Is that bypass. And that little curve is something that the rail feels would help them. And as was stated before, it really has no impact on us. The impact on us is going to be the bypass, and we need to continue to push that bypass, promote that bypass. And I know Gretna would be in favor of that. They are in favor of the bypass. They are very much in favor of it. getting that rail out of those neighborhoods. Right. And the folks in, in our parish are in favor of it, so I can get it out of Bell Chase. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Any other comments from the table? Audience? Hi, uh, this is Kendall Dix, 1010 Common Street, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70112. Uh, I just wanted to point out um, a couple things. Uh, PLT says it's going to be online by the second quarter of uh, 2020. Um, I don't think anyone in any document or anyone on this earth thinks that the uh, pipeline would be um, uh, ready by second quarter 2020. Um, I just heard the port say that existing, uh, the existing rail will not put the port where it needs to be. Uh, we also heard earlier that the uh, $30 million value of the land seems to be tied to its viability as an export terminal. Um, so I would just point out that where we are right now is that we have a piece of land that is valued uh, on its viability as an export terminal, and we have just heard that right now um, that, uh, the, that operation in its current state is not economically viable. That is not true. That is incorrect. All right, thank you. I'm on record of saying that's incorrect. Okay. And maybe you just misunderstood what I said. But I can live with the present configuration to kick off the PLT. And that's what we're going to do. And we're pushing to get the rail to go around, as we always have, that was done before I even got here almost six years ago to bring it down Harvey Canal around the Naval Air Station. All right, I'll but just we're not going to rely me. on the rail and crude on the rail to really get the PLT up and going. The main uh, medium for that feedstock will be pipeline. All right. I'm, maybe you misspoke, but you guys can go back and look at the video again yeah. if you want. Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, I didn't catch his name in the draft. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Could you state your name, please? Kendall Dix. In the draft, please, for the record. 1010 Common Street, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70112. Okay. You got it? Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Next, anybody else? Grace Myers with the Sierra Club. Um, in New Orleans, 716 oh, Adams Street. Excuse me, could you take your time and present your name and your address so everyone can hear you? Grace Morris Thank you. with the Sierra Club. Grace Morris with the Sierra Club um, in New Orleans, 716 Adams Street. Uh, so we have been hearing about this rail relocation proposal for a long time. Gretna doesn't buy it. I know that. Um, there's a lot of hope that it'll happen. Um, and uh, my question is, who's going to pay for that rail relocation? Um, we know that the rail applied for a federal Tiger Grant fund um, and was denied on uh, economic justification back in 2008. And so, y you know, um, are you all saying that you think that's going to happen? Uh, it seems there's conflicting accounts that it will happen. Um, but and if, if you're saying that it will happen, where's the money? Who's going to pay for that? And has the port or the parish um, been reapplying for, for grants? Um, and if it's not going to happen, um, then 
that site doesn't need to be the site of an oil export terminal? I can answer Thank that, you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. And those are good questions. Director. Those are really good questions. I, I have private money that is waiting to be invested in this. They are waiting for it to get kicked off on a commercialization. I cannot talk, tell you who they are, but you will, you will know soon. Uh, we are going to take advantage of uh, any low interest loans that are there, but for the predominance of that bypass, it is going to be private funding. But again, those are good, good questions and good concerns. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments from the floor? Next item, please. Number eight, approval of the May 9th, 2019 meeting minutes. All for a second. Second by Ms. Albrook. Machine is open. Passes uh, eight zero. Adjournment. I offer to adjourn. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Albrook. The meeting machine is open. Passes eight zero. The meeting adjourned at two eighteen.